thank you uh, for having me join you as you meet on the traditional Treaty 6 lands. Uh, it seems really just like just yesterday uh, that I was last here speaking to you uh, about this time last year. I believe uh, I was part of the panel, that uh, similar panel that you guys saw this morning. Um, I, I was the newly minted leader of uh, Alberta's NDP, the third party, and I was on that panel with Raj Sherman and Danielle Smith, if I recall. So, things have changed a bit. <laughs> But uh, I want to say that it is really uh, important for me to be here because I value and I know that my caucus values the relationship that we have and that we want to build with you. The AMDC has always, have always been great partners with government and we just uh, very much want to see that continue. After all, we know that we all want the same thing. Healthy and vibrant communities that can provide jobs, homes, schools and opportunities for Albertans. And you are the level of government that is closest to the people that we all serve. By listening to you, we are listening to the voices of Albertans in all their regional, economic, and cultural diversity. And I know personally that voice firsthand, and I have to say being with you feels a bit like a homecoming. As you know, I grew up in Fairview in the heart of the peace, and I know what a wonderful quality of life we can enjoy in a warm, tightly knit community that is proud of its business and industry, proud of its heritage, proud of its educational and recreational opportunities, and most of all, proud of its people. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I certainly have. No matter where I go in the world, and literally, I mean no matter, this even happened to me once when I was in Africa, it, it seems always the case that I meet somebody that knows somebody from Fairview. And so I've long since coined the term that all roads lead to Fairview. And I suspect that many of you know that and feel that way about your communities as well. And those are views that are shared by uh, at least 13 government MLAs who are hard at work for rural, resource-driven, northern agriculture, agricultural and, and other communities each and every day outside of our cities. Communities like yours are extremely well represented in our government in the full meaning of the phrase. And that's also true at our cabinet table. Energy Minister Marg McQuaid Boyd represents Dunvegan Central Peace Notley which, if you'll forgive me for saying so, is an excellent name for provincial riding. Um, and, I, and I offer once again my thanks to the former government for that name. Municipal Affairs Minister Danielle Larravee represents Lesser Slave Lake. Agricultural Minister O'Neill Carrier represents White Court St. Anne. And a number of us around the cabinet table have deep roots in smaller communities around this province. So we care about your communities and we're going to be very good partners with you in the years to come. So I want to speak to you about three issues today. First, I'm going to outline some of the measures that we've uh, taken in our provincial budget a few weeks ago and that I think are important to you. And then I want to say a few words about two other issues that I think are affecting all Albertans and are part of a major conversation across this province. Um, the issue of welcoming refugees from Syria and taking action on climate change. So let's start with our budget and its impact on your jurisdictions and some of the plans that we have moving forward. And I want to begin by, by asking all of you to sort of remember, of course we, all, we don't have to think hard, uh, it, it's in front of us every day, to consider the environmental context in which we are operating. We, all of us in Alberta, have inherited an historic drop in the price of oil. And with that comes the challenges that that drop in the price of oil presents to our communities and to their economies and to the families that live within each. So we know as a government that we must balance the fiscal challenges faced by the province with the immediate difficulties faced by families and communities as the economy slows. So a few things in terms of the overall context within which we are committed to continue operating. Under our plan, 93% of Albertans pay less tax than they would have under the Prentice budget that was first introduced last spring. Overall, Alberta remains and Albertans remain the lowest tax jurisdiction in the country by a long shot and we will remain that way for the term of our government. So within that, we have the priorities of our budget. By now, you've probably heard that there are three budget pillars uh, that are 
uh, that, that are revealed through our budget. Stable public services, moving towards a balanced budget in a thoughtful, considered way, and job creation and, div and economic diversification. These pillars were adopted by our government with the real life experience of Alberta's families in mind. So let's talk about public services. Public services are the backbone of Alberta's communities, both large and small. Hospitals across Alberta are the first point of contact for parents when their children get sick. Teachers in local schools get to know families as well as their students. The local library is a community gathering space and an after school hangout. Providing stable public services means your children will have schools to go to and teachers to teach them. Your families and constituents will have health care when they need it and access to other important public service providers. Now our government is also providing more than a billion a year in municipal grant funding to help you provide stable public services that are in your areas of responsibility. As you know, most of that money comes from the Alberta Community Partnership and the Municipal Sustainability Initiative that includes the basic municipal transportation grant. Stable public services extends to the infrastructure as well that those services depend on. Hospitals and regional care centers in Edson, Grand Prairie, High Prairie and Fort McMurray remain funded and underway. And we've made a commitment to small scale municipal infrastructure such as drainage and bridges in this budget. I know there are hundreds of local bridges that need repair to keep people safe. In all, our government is investing $34 billion over the next five years. That includes $3.8 billion for schools, $4.7 billion for roads and bridges, and $2.2 billion for health facilities and equipment. And today, my Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure announced that our government is investing $545 million over five years to fund critical water infrastructure in municipalities across Alberta. That announcement itself is $170 million or a 45.3% increase compared to the previously proposed March budget. We strongly believe that reliable access to high quality drinking water and wastewater treatment systems is crucial for building strong, healthy communities and rural economies. The increases that I've just outlined that we are planning to the capital budget will create eight to 10,000 new jobs in communities like yours and will increase the GDP of the province of Alberta by about 0.5%. So we are taking an evidence-based and fiscally responsible approach to infrastructure investments and that approach includes listening to you. Of the $34 billion earmarked for infrastructure over the next five years, $4.4 billion is for new projects and programs that are not yet identified. We will be looking to you to identify the needs and priorities for these funds as you meet with our ministers. And we are looking carefully for useful and well thought out shovel ready initiatives that make sense. Our government will start consultations next year with you and other partners and stakeholders to restore the strategic transportation infrastructure program in the 2017-2018 fiscal year. And we expect $100 million to be available between 2017 and 2019. Now our government will also work with you and all municipalities to modernize the Municipal Government Act in time for 2017. As our province grows, it is important to recognize that our communities transcend municipal boundaries. And I know that many districts and counties rely on linear property tax as their main source of revenue. So let me be clear, we will not compromise the ability of rural municipalities to serve their residents. We are approaching this issue with one question in mind, how we best ensure that all rural Albertans and their communities are supported. And that's why I've created a cabinet committee chaired by the Minister of Economic Development, Darren Billis, and including the Minister of Finance, Joe Sisi, and the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Danielle Larravi. And as they work and consider whether there are ways to improve how our communities grow and are funded, I commit to you that the AAMDC and its members will be a fundamental part of, an early, of those discussions, an early and a very determinative part of those discussions at the very first stages.
In addition, I also welcome the AMDC's recent offer of collaboration to build better relationships with our Indigenous peoples as outlined in a, in a letter of November 6. And I agree that as, culture, that as a culture and as a province, we must share in righting past wrongs and in making sure that Indigenous people can contribute to and benefit from a new and optimistic economic future in our province. And let's talk a little bit about our future, because in our view, that future includes a more diversified economy that offers more jobs and more opportunities for economic growth. It includes diversification within and beyond our energy sector. It includes, for instance, value-added agricultural products. And it includes, as well, developing the intellectual property and innovation of people who are ready to turn their ideas into marketable products and services in any field of endeavor. And so that's why, as another strategy, our budget is mobilizing almost $2.1 billion to support job creation and diversification. We're increasing the resources available to the Alberta Treasury branches by $1.5 billion so it can offer additional loans on commercial terms to small and medium enterprises trying to get to that next stage in their economic development. We will invest $50 million over the next two years into the Alberta Enterprise Corporation to support entrepreneurship and a venture capital market. And the Alberta Investment Management Corporation, or AIMCO, will set aside 3% of our heritage fund, $540 million, to encourage and invest in business growth, business growth by businesses in Alberta. And to encourage employers to lean in the direction of hiring, we are offering new job creation incentives that will reward eligible job creators in your communities with grants of up to $5,000 for each new job created. And then, just to underline how very much we care about job creation, especially for young people, we are restoring the STEP program. And I really hope that you take advantage of that program to create opportunities for young people in your communities. So, to summarize, we are facing some challenges economically in our province, but we are working uh, very hard to address those challenges, and we want to be able to work together with the AMDC. You are all about building your communities, and we've put some very significant new tools forward in our budget to help you do that. Let's work together to put those tools to work for the people we all represent. Now, I'd like to speak briefly about two other issues that affect all Albertans. First, I know you join me in, my, prof in uh, my profound concern about the trend of events that we've been seeing in the Middle East. What is happening there is an unfolding tragedy that has led to a massive wave of refugees fleeing terror and violence. And I know you share my outrage and sorrow at seeing that terror and violence inflicted on the people of Paris and Beirut a few days ago. Those crimes were outrageous and intolerable, and they are happening every day in parts of Syria and Iraq. So like all Canadians, we in Alberta condemn these crimes. We look for justice and we ask ourselves, what can we do? So the Prime Minister was elected to provide national leadership on this issue, and he made a commitment in the recent election to provide sanctuary for up to 25,000 refugees from Syria and Iraq before the end of this year. Based on our population, that means about 3,000 people will be joining us here in Alberta. We have been debating this matter in the legislature, and the position of the Alberta government is very clear. First, the federal government must ensure the safety and security of our own people here in Canada. That means refugees applying to come to Canada must be meticulously screened, and the risk that violent criminals will exploit a humanitarian effort must be effectively addressed. Seeing to the safety and security of our country is one of the Government of Canada's basic jobs. And I am sure that Prime Minister Trudeau is mindful of this responsibility and will see to it that it is de dealt with as a top priority. So that done, we will then do our part. And I know that we will rise to the challenge. I know we will open our hearts, I know we will open our arms and our doors because that's the kind of people we are and have always been. Today's refugees who come to make a better life for their families now will contribute to our community and to our leadership and our economic activities in the future. And the future is on my mind for many reasons, and one of them 
is because I will also be leading the Alberta delegation to the United Nations Conference on Climate Change the first week of December in Paris. Now that conference will proceed and our government will take part because that is our best answer to the insanity and the criminality committed in Paris by people who have lost all touch with humanity, including their own. Paris lives and we will be there. The whole world is going to Paris in early December to build, to work together, to care for each other, and to move forward together. We will bring to Paris a new Alberta climate leadership plan that corrects some serious mistakes committed by the previous government and sets us on a new road. Our government's predecessors, predecessors believed they were helping the energy industry by ignoring climate change and by failing to act on the environmental challenges our province faces. We saw where that got us when the United States decided to reject the XL pipeline, in part, so they said, Alberta's energy is among the, quote, dirtiest oil in the world. That is not true. In fact, the heavy oil the U.S. currently is importing from other countries is a far more environmentally damaging energy source than Alberta's oil sands production delivered by pipelines. But President Obama certainly gave us all a very important wake-up call, that we are paying with our reputation for a failure to act on one of the biggest problems facing this planet. So just like we will do our part for refugees, we will do our part for climate change too. In a few days, we will set out our plan to the people of Alberta. In general, as we've talked about in the past and as we talked about in our budget speech, we will phase out electricity generated by burning coal over time. And in its place, we will create thousands of jobs building and operating cleaner natural gas and renewable electricity plants. Some of you have written to me about this initiative and let me assure you, we believe no one should carry the cost of this necessary conversion disproportionately. And so we will be providing appropriate support and adjustment and programs to help all of us move forward in an equitable way. And we are going to promote, for the first time ever in Alberta, energy efficiency to help industry, communities, individual Albertans, and your governments and ours reduce the energy that we use in our province. And we will reduce the pollution that we put into the atmosphere and promote greater energy efficiency and lower emissions by putting a fair price on carbon. These steps should have been taken 10 to 15 years ago, and now we are playing catch up. As we saw with the XL pipeline decision, our major energy markets are less and less inclined to cut us any slack on our environmental policies. Not a new single pipeline has been built in any direction under the old policies pursued by previous governments because our neighbours are trying to force us to adopt better policies. And it is our view that it is time for us to act. It's time to act to reduce pollution for the sake of the health of our children and also because it's the right thing to do and because by acting we will have a made in Alberta solution that works for Alberta was decided by Albertans and keeps our capital and our wealth and our resources here in Alberta. So in conclusion, you are community leaders. You know our energy economy is facing tough times at the moment. And you know that if we keep doing the same thing, we're going to get the same results. So I believe it is time for change. It's time for a new approach to how we manage Alberta's public service and our finances, how we build and diversify our economy, and how we take action on climate change. And given the shocking events of recent days, I'm going to be very proud to join governments from all over the world to take that last issue in Paris, to Paris, two weeks from now. None of us is afraid. We're going to keep doing our part to make a better world. And it, of course, starts here at home in our Alberta communities and with your government and mine as partners. I look so forward to working together with you over the months or the weeks and the months to come as we come together to work with the, on the many, many challenges that we face, knowing that we can make progress 
that we can move forward and that we can make lives better for the people that we all represent. Thank you very much for being here and listening to me, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your meetings here today.